The US-China trade deal threatens Australia. Let's have a look. Hello everyone, I'm Florian Heiser and welcome to another episode of Heiser Says. I've got my stein of coffee and I'm just relaxing on a Sunday morning. I thought we'd have a look at this article that a few people have shared this one with me or similar ones from news.com discussing the impact of the US-China trade deal on Australia. Now, before we go through it, let's just jump over to one of my favorite websites, the Observatory of Economic Complexity, just to remind ourselves a few things about our glorious nation of Australia. You can see here all of our exports, how large they are, iron ore, you know, 48.2 billion, coal, 47 billion. And if we compare that to a few other things, I'll just bring up this overlay showing you the size of our tourist industry, 60 billion. 60 billion, that's about 3% of the national GDP. So you can see coal and iron ore are what, two thirds individually, are two thirds to the entire tourist sector here of Australia. Now, these are, you know, we're a pretty simple economy. Our top exports of Australia are iron ore, coal, gold, petroleum, and wheat. Okay, so we're not an advanced economy, and that's where our economic complexity of 59th in the world comes out. And if we jump to another matrix or another methodology for measuring, I'll just bring that up here here. This is the Harvard Atlas. And you can see here at the Harvard Atlas, Australia is ranked 93rd out of 133 nations in the world. But if we jump back to the OEC, we have a look here. Where are the destinations for our exports? 35% to China, 3.5% to the United States. So China is, well, the top destination for our exports. China, then Japan, South Korea, India, and Hong Kong. So if you think of that, you combine Hong Kong and China, that's nearly a hundred billion dollars worth of Australian exports go to those two countries. So let's jump back and have a look at this article with that in mind, just the scale, the importance of China on our trade sector. And while I mentioned tourism, you have to understand we get a lot of tourists from all of Asia and China. International students as well, a big chunk of those are coming from China. I know, I worked with both mainland and Hong Kong Chinese and Taiwanese on uni assignments at, at, uh, at uni. So, Australian markets smashed through record highs after the United States and China signed the first phase of a trade deal that could put an end to more than two years of tensions and hit local exporters. Do you think it will? Well, it feels more like it's status quo. Former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, who was in the White House for the signing of the deal, said China's commitments to purchase more US goods were phenomenally large and posed a major risk to Australian agricultural exports and the coal and liquefied natural gas industries. The agreement could see the US leapfrog Australia as the largest exporter of LNG as the $200 billion deal compels China to purchase energy, manufacturing, and agricultural goods in exchange for the U.S. cutting tariffs on $110 billion worth of imports. Scott Morrison has to reassure the Australian public that we won't become collateral damage in this, Mr. Rudd told the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. How? How can he reassure the public? Does, I mean, does, does Ruddy really believe that Morrison can dictate where the China, where China is going to buy their goods from? You know, if anything, one could argue that maybe stabilization of this trade debacle might in, entice China to start manufacturing more. But then again, there's the whole question of what are they manufacturing? How many ghost cities can you produce with Australian iron ore? So. How can the U.S. pursue another $32 billion of American beef, wheat, cotton, and seafood, all listed in the agreement without Australian exporters becoming collateral damage? It's a similar story for energy. This is particularly pressing, given we have zero political and diplomatic relationship with Beijing at the moment. Well, I, I can't say Rudd is any position to, you know, he <laughs> wasn't really the poster boy improving our relationships. I'll move that over here so it's a bit more centered. Improving our relationships with Beijing, was he? Prime Minister Morrison 
was invited to a state dinner at the White House in September, but the government has been largely frozen out by the Chinese Communist Party, following raising concerns over political interference and national security. Well, this is the problem, guys. Our nation, we're simply an exporting nation of simple products that you can get in other parts of the world too. What competitive advantage do we have? Trade Minister Simon Birmingham said the deal was a truce rather than a complete elimination of trade tensions. And that's, that's right on the money. The dispute had threatened to explode into an all-out trade war over allegations of intellectual property theft and frustrations from US President Donald Trump over President persistent trade deficits with China. There's more likely to be movement from the US side in areas such as pork, poultry and soybeans that are much smaller commodities for Australia compared with the ones that we've seen such huge growth in our Chinese exports in recent years, Senator Birmingham said. Australia's LNG industry is the most exposed to the agreement. Chinese authorities have been increasingly looking to gas to offset coal-fired power and reduce emissions. China's coal imports plunged from 21 million tons in November to 2.8 million tons in December. Well, there you go. There you go. And where is most of our LNG production? A big chunk of it is in WA. Bay is one of the deal will force China to buy at least 18.5 billion more in energy products from the US than it did in 2017. That is double the record high of total energy exports from the US to China. That's bad news for Australia the world's current largest LNG exporter, said Commonwealth Bank's commodity analyst Vivek Da. He said LNG exports sold, sold under long-term contracts from Australia to China are less likely to be impacted. Industry leaders warned the one-on-one -on -one negotiations, which will continue to sideline the World Trade Organization, still posed a threat to multilateral deals that have balanced the interests of superpowers and smaller economies like Australia. This deal will undermine the principles of free trade, which have underpinned Australia's bipartisan approach to trade policy for many decades, Acting Minerals Council of Australia Chief Executive Gavin Lind said. Markets took little notice of the long-term implications, buoyed by the prospect of more than two years of destabilizing global tensions drawing to a close. The ASX index soared past 7,000 points within 20 minutes of opening and held the record high for the rest of Thursday. Newfound consumer and business confidence drove the bores up by 47 points after news of a deal broke. China's Vice Premier Liu He said Phase 1 was a mutual beneficial win-win agreement. It will bring about stable economic growth, promote world peace and prosperity, and is in the interests of the producers, consumers, investors in both countries, he said. Australia's Ambassador to Washington, Joe Hockey, urged caution. It's written on rice paper. Anyone can tear it up at any moment. Yes, that's exactly what it, you know, it's apparently there are conditions in this agreement that either party can completely withdraw it at any moment. If another party accuses the other party of doing something unfavorably, they can just withdraw unilaterally. It's a step in the right direction. If it's just about purchasing more goods, then it's not a solution. Mr. Trump said he would travel to Beijing later in the year to begin talks on the next stage of the deal. The second phase is expected to deliver more tariff relief for China in exchange for tighter restrictions on intellectual property. And this is a big issue in China is the intellectual property theft from the West. Some could even argue systematic deindustrialization of Western nations. But, you know, th these tariffs are pr pretty much only hurting the American consumers. They're putting up cost of living for all the products they're buying from China. And it's reducing the, the export capacity of the Chinese. We'll have to see. We'll have to see where this all leads and what implications it will have on Australia. Do you think? Do you think that all this argument of you know, well, our GDP growth, it's trending down, guys, and everyone is talking about property shooting up, property shooting. The ASX is shooting up. It's all good. It's all good. But here we have a potential trade deal that could have implications on our nation. We've got issues here with GDP growth still going down. We've got wage growth is just non-existent. What is going to spur this property bubble, which is pretty much all we have? If we lose, you know, if our iron or coal, LNG goes down, all our natural resources go down. If tourism, guys, if tourism falls significantly, 
what is going to spur the growth here in the economy to keep us out of recession? Think about that and let me know your opinions in the comments below. And thank you to everyone. Hang on, wrong chart. Thank you to everyone for joining me for this episode. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. If you're a fan and want to help us produce more content, I have a Patreon where you can make a small monthly donation. We also have the ability where you can join the channel here on YouTube and get access to badges and emojis. You can also support the channel by using our referral links to Independent Reserve for your tra crypto trading or to Amazon or eBay for your consumer purchases. It's a great way for you to support a content creator without incurring any additional cost. We receive an advertiser's commission and you know, thank you very much. It all adds up. We also have PayPal for direct donations and our merchandise that we sell on the Heiser Says website. Take care, everyone. Have a great day and I will talk to you later. Bye for now.